Thank you, Brother Mike. The most practical exhortation, I suppose, that we could raise today is actually in the text. God has given us the exhortation, and it's found in the sixth verse, flee out. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Anytime the word of God is declared, it demands a response of those that hear it. When the people of the day of Pentecost heard the words that Peter gave, they said, what shall we do? Remember that? Yeah. Amen. Whenever the Thessalonians, the word of God came to the Thessalonians, I like that kind of view of things, the word of God pervading and working its work. The scripture says that they responded and turned to God from, the, from, from idols and served the living and true God. See, it demands a response. And indifference is a response. If we do nothing when we hear the word of God, that is a response. But, of course, I know that I'm in the company of godly people who want to do the will of God. And so I'm just going to give some direction to that. Everything that God asks us to do becomes practical and reasonable to us in light of the knowledge of God and of his work in salvation. Whenever David can see God rightly and he knows the battle belongs to the Lord, fearing Goliath becomes unreasonable. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? You know, uncircumcised people were an offense to God. Those were the, God would not fellowship with people who weren't circumcised. It was a marvelous picture of the necessity of righteousness and holiness and being separate from things that are unclean. David charged that field and killed Goliath. And we don't talk about the fearing and quaking Israelites. We talk about the marvelous David because he saw God. When Moses saw God rightly... He could forsake Egypt without even being told by God to do it. He didn't have a command. He didn't have a command from God to forsake Egypt, and yet he saw the practicality of doing it when he saw the invisible God and knew the hammer was coming down. Right? When Peter saw Jesus clearly, he walked on water in the midst of the raging sea. And you know, just like I do, when you see Christ clearly, you want to close the distance. Right? Amen. And as many bad things are said, supposedly, about Peter, he's the only man that has ever walked on water beside Jesus. You ever walked on water? We shouldn't criticize this godly man, just as a side note. We should not criticize someone, as especially who has done more than we have done. He walked on water. And we talk about that to this very day. You see, brethren, everything God has said becomes reasonable when we see the God who said it. And the only reason why people don't do what God has said is because it's not, it doesn't seem reasonable to them. So now you know the objective of the devil is to get you to think that God's holding out, and when you think God's holding out, you're going to partake of the forbidden fruit. You've got to see God right. Amen. And what can we see today of God from a text like this and from this great judgment that we know is coming and leveling this Babylonish spirit? What can we know about God that makes an exhortation like coming out from among them and being separate practical and reasonable? God is a righteous God. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. And he will not compromise when it comes to unrighteousness. Habakkuk was in some senses perplexed because people that were less righteous than others were being persecuted. That were, they were persecuting people that more, were more righteous than they were. And it didn't make any sense why they weren't being judged right away. Because he knew God doesn't yield when it comes to unrighteousness. The truth of the matter is the revelation of the righteous judgment of God is coming on unrighteousness. In fact, the real truth is it already is beginning to come. The scripture says very clearly 
that the wrath of God is already being revealed against all unrighteousness of men. We have already, brethren, God has already given us an ample demonstration of what he thinks of men who will not separate from what he hates. In Noah's day, the flood came upon all the earth. Water did not stop until every living creature was dead. Why? Because violence covered the earth. The inclination of every man was completely unrighteous. God didn't put up with it. If you go to Sodom and Gomorrah, you find the same thing. To this present day, we have an example of what happens when the hammer falls down from God. That city has never recovered. And in its place is a dead sea from which there is nothing profitable. You say, well, well but that was the Old Testament God. What about the New Testament God? Hmm? When Ananias and Sapphira lie to God and to the Holy Spirit, they dropped dead in the assembly. Killed them. God does not change. And if you can see that clearly, an application like this, come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be a father unto you will mean more to you than anything else. So let me encourage you to do that because here is a primary purpose of Babylon when it comes to the elect is to seek to try and wed what's right with what's unright, which, with what's unrighteous. That is the primary work because the devil knows that when you're favored by God, there's no way you can come down unless you become willing to put your hand to something God hates and to lay hold on it. Remember when Balaam taught Balak to do that very thing? Balaam first said, well, I can't curse him. Remember Balak said, curse him. I want to bring him down. Balaam said, I can't curse him. And he leveled a great blessing for them. But through Balaam's cunningness, he said, ha ha. But if you can bring unrighteous women among them, you'll bring them down. And that's what Babylon is all about. So it's not my job up here to have dominion over your faith and lay down the 200,000 hit list of what unrighteousness is and define all that. That's between you and God. But you've got to define what this is, especially as it relates in a religious context to a supposed Christ that has no power and allows for people to remain unrighteous. We have got to separate ourselves from anything that makes us believe that we can unite to what's wrong and God will still approve of us. That is not the case. Do not be a partaker of her abominations. And God give you the grace to be able to discern and understand what that all is. Because this is a big and horrible pollution that has covered the earth. So, brother, let me encourage you with that. And God be with you in this work. It's an honorable work. God will uphold you if you're serious about this. He'll preserve you and keep you unto his heavenly kingdom. And I can assure you of this. God can treat you infinitely better than the world can. And to me, that's almost a denigration to God to even begin to compare the goodness of God with some measure of what appears to be goodness from the world. God's good. Trust him. Separate. God will bless you. We open it up for your comments.